Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Morales. I am the manager of cultural programming here at the LGBT Community Center. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It was a beautiful day. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but we do these kinds of programs um, every, every day of the year. Uh, we're open 364 days of the year, with the exception of Juneteenth. Um, but we offer community services for those that need any community support, whether it be recovery programming, mental health services, HIV screening, STI screening, um, youth programs, and arts and culture programming, like tonight's event. Uh, so I want to thank the Center for Puerto Rican Studies for bringing this here. Uh, there's a couple of other organizations. <laughs> the, other, the other center. Um, but this, having programs like this means a lot to me. Um, as a queer Puerto Rican that grew up in Canarsie, Brooklyn, there were very little to no queer references that I could think of or refer to um, growing up. So to see a new generation of scholar, scholarly work, activism, and art that reflects those experiences gives me hope for future queer Boricua folks. And I'm so happy to have this and honored that this event is taking place here. I would love to bring Greg from the Bureau of General Services Queer Division Bookstore. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Uh, so my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder, along with my partner, Donnie Jokum, of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. How many people have never heard of this strange bureau? Oh, most of you know it. I said, how many have not heard of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division before? Oh, okay, most of you know it, great. Well, for the five of you who don't. So the Bureau is a queer bookstore, all volunteer independent queer bookstore that is upstairs on the second floor in room 210. Uh, our hours are Wednesdays through Sundays from one to 7 p.m. and we often stay open late for events. So we often host events in our room, but for tonight we figured we need a little more space. So we were very happy that the center agreed to co-present co this event with us. So we are here to celebrate the launch of Cuentos Completos, Manuel Ramos Sotero. Sadly, we don't have many copies. We have this copy, which you can look at, but you cannot take. Um, but we are pre-selling copies uh, in the back with our volunteer, Kevin. And if you would like to pre-purchase a copy, you can do so, and we'll take down your email address and let you know when copies have arrived, hopefully very soon. Um, if you would like to be on our email list to find out about our upcoming events, we have a sign-up sheet over with the other books. I should also mention, we have books by several of our readers. We have books by um, Gerard Cabrera, by Huascar Robles, and by Emmanuel Xavier. So you can buy their books tonight and take them home. Uh, but Cuentos Completos, you will need to wait. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to do is read a land acknowledgement and a little statement. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization, and of course the center, operates on the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape. We encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community House's Manhattan Fund. The Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manhattanfund.org. We also want to recognize that today is the 120th day of Israel's genocidal campaign against the Palestinian people. Funded by our tax dollars, and enabled by our government's unwavering support. We hope that you will join us in calling for an immediate, permanent ceasefire, an end to the siege, and an end to the occupation in order to stop the collective punishment of the Palestinians and to ensure the swift delivery of much needed food, water, medicine, fuel, and medical aid to the people of Gaza. So, thank you.
So we hope you'll come to visit the Bureau um, one of these days. Like I said, we're open Wednesdays through Sundays, 1 to 7. And if you'd like to find out more about the store and our upcoming events, feel free to stop by the table in the back corner. For now, I will turn it over to Gerard Cabrera. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you, Donnie, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Publishing Triangle, the LGBTQ Publishing Association, I want to welcome you to tonight's book launch of Manuel Ramos Otero's Cuentos Completos. Tonight's historic event couldn't have happened without a lot of teamwork from our friends, hosts, and co-sponsors. Thanks to the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, New York City's preeminent book space for our communities, to the LGBTQ Center here for providing us this beautiful room and other support, and thank you to Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College CUNY, and of course, the Institute for Puerto Rican Culture in San Juan, Puerto Rico, whose publishing arm, Ediciones Callejon, is the US publisher of the book that we're celebrating tonight. And to start our celebration, please welcome Angel Antonio Ruiz Laboy, Associate Director of Arts and Culture at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angel Antonio. Eh, voy a estar hablando en español. Y tengo que admitir que estoy nervioso porque <laughs> llevamos esperando esta presentación hace nueve años. Uh, por años estuvimos condenados a traficar su literatura. Manuel Ramos Otero fue un mito para varias generaciones que solo conocimos su obra a través de fotocopias y PDFs. Y cuando digo fotocopia, hablo de la fotocopia, de la fotocopia, de la fotocopia, de la fotocopia. <laughs> Su culto en los departamentos de literatura de la Universidad de Puerto Rico era inversamente proporcional a la disponibilidad de su trabajo. Con suerte, aparecían ejemplares de invitación al, al polvo o cuentos de buena tinta en librería mágica o en librería Norberto González de vez en cuando. Y ahí era donde era bueno ser amigo de Luis Negrón, que siempre te decía, mira lo que te conseguí. Eh, y claro, te decía, no se lo diga a nadie, y tú se lo decía a todo el mundo. Y siempre había alguien que decía, pero me dijo lo mismo y sacaba su libro de la mochila y te lo enseñaba. So, uno no se sentía tan especial. Este, <ríe> si bien era difícil conseguir sus publicaciones, yo jamás pensé lo difícil que era publicar a Manuel Ramos Otero. Señores, eso era otra cosa. Eh, cuando yo comencé a trabajar en la editorial del Instituto de Cultura puertorriqueña en el 2013, eh, pues quise revolucionar esa, esa editorial eh, y traer e incluir libros eh, que hablaran de las diversidades, de, de todas las diversidades. Incluimos Ángela María Dávila en los libros de poesía, eh, Publicamos autores vivos en la editorial del Instituto de Cultura puertorriqueña, imagínense. Eh, publicamos San Juan Gay, cuyo autor está aquí con nosotros hoy. Eh, nada, muchísimas cosas. Pero publicar a Ramos Otero fue el dolor de cabeza. <coughs> Aunque fue una de mis primeras gestiones en el 2014, cuando empe empezamos las conversaciones con Arnaldo y con Caridad en Casa de las Américas, no fue hasta mi salida en el 2017 que casi el último día se firmó el contrato. Tardó tres años en conseguirse los derechos de autor para firmar el libro. ¿Qué pasó? 2017, noviembre, eh, son las elecciones, gana Trump y todas las relaciones con Cuba se fueron a, usted, a, a donde ustedes ya saben dónde. Eh, entonces, esa, esa edición no se logró, salió la publicación en Cuba, pero la de Puerto Rico se detuvo por mucho tiempo. No más espera. El libro existe, le prometemos que existe. Yo tengo una copia, aunque no están aquí, el libro existe. <risa> eh, 
Y, y como Manuel mismo supo, ¿verdad? Porque Manuel tuvo una editorial que, que creó aquí en el 1976, el libro Viaje, donde publicó a otra gente, entre ellos en Nairi Rivera, a Víctor Fragoso, a Silén, con quien eh, coordinó ese proyecto. Eh, los libros no son esfuerzos individuales, pero los libros sí tienen un motor importante. Y el motor importante de este libro se, se llama Arnaldo Cruz Malavé. Un aplauso para él. El, eh, los antólogos yo pienso que son eh, figuras prometeicas, ¿verdad? Que, que van y se meten a los archivos, descubren cosas, las editan, las trabajan, las rescatan eh, y nos las devuelven a nosotros los humanos como si fuera el fuego, como si fuera la luz, ¿verdad? Eh, y eso es un acto de enorme generosidad lo que hacen los antólogos. Eh, gracias a esta publicación, nuevas generaciones no van a leer la fotocopia mala de la otra fotocopia, ¿verdad? Van a tener un libro donde van a poder estudiar a Ramos Otero con la seriedad y con el compromiso que se merece que lo estudiamos. Si bien con la escasez que había de su obra, hubo muchas publicaciones, muchas tesis, esperamos que luego de este libro haya muchas otras más, muchos nuevos acercamientos y tenga el lugar en el sitial literario que Manuel Ramos Otero merece y que la colonia y la homofobia le negó en Puerto Rico. Así que gracias Arnaldo y los dejo con el resto de esta presentación. Muy buenas noches. It exists, okay? Es real. <laughs> es real, es verídico, it exists, okay? Uh, thank you very much. I'm Arnaldo Cruz Malavez. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, to the Bureau. It has a long title, so I'll just call it the Bureau. <laughs> Thanks to the Center, uh, the LGBTQ Center, the Center. Thanks to El Centro de Estudios Puerto Riqueños, El Centro. And thanks to the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, El Instituto. Uh, okay, thank you very much for, the, uh, for this opportunity, for joining forces to make sure that this is published. And thanks to Callejón Press, which is a separate press. Thank you, Callejón. Uh, but mostly, thank you for being here. Uh, I am uh, so pleasantly surprised that everyone is here. Uh, and that, you know, that people range from uh, family, uh, uh, second generation primos, uh, you know. Friends. The friends, that's it. People who take care of your cat, things like that. Um, so thank you so much, thank you so much. I, I really do truly believe that um, that is to, uh, only, and it, you know, if it's an exaggeration, please, but that's okay. Accept an ex my exaggeration for the for tonight. Uh, only the br the brilliantly combative uh, and unyieldingly poetic spirit of Manuel Ramos Otero, what my uh, grandmother would have called Espíritu de Luz, uh, Espíritu inquieto y de luz. Uh, could have inspired this historic collaboration among, not only just about the historic collaboration, among El Centro, the Center, and the Institute, you know? <laughs> this had never happened, and so I am glad that it has happened and that it will hopefully continue to happen. All right. Um, this uh, and so thank you very much for, for being here to celebrate uh, the return of sorts of Manuel Ramos Otero lit literary work to, uh, and we will be speaking in English and Spanish, I forgot to tell, um, uh, to the place where it was written, NYC, New York City, okay? Uh, after over 30 years in which his collections of short stories were out of print, and over 30 years since his untimely death from AIDS. Um, this, this anthology originated, as you said, uh, in a very convoluted way. It originated in a conversation. For me, it originated in a conversation that I had many, many, many more years than I can re uh, wish to re recall or to remember in the kitchen of my house um, in, in Jackson Heights. Um, with my dear Cuban friends, Caridad Tamayo, a literary scholar at Casa de las Americas in Havana, when in the midst of eating and drinking, 
joking and 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 joking and lamenting uh, the unmistakably uh, combative and tender figure of Manuel Ramos Otero suddenly appeared uh, before us, inciting us, even ordering us to um, publish his out of print text. Since then, the shadow of this insistent and beloved and feared spirit um, that was Manuel Ramos Otero has uh, not left us, has loomed over us, urging caridad, me, Angel, Angel Antonia, and me uh, to, um, to, uh, to publish his out of print stories in simultaneous editions in Havana and in San Juan. Casa de las Americas were, was supposed to transcribe the unpublished stories that I had found in the archives at Columbia University, and the Instituto would obtain the rights and provide original transcript, uh, transcripts of his published works. Um, it was 2019. 2019, and the Cuban edition was ready to go to print uh, in Casa de las Americas series of Latin American and Caribbean classics, next to the novel of his much of Manuel's much admired um, author uh, Cortázar. Um, when unexpectedly and ironically, another global pandemic, this time COVID-19, broke out, delaying the, this, its publication. The current, uh, this current edition, which was also delayed due to the pandemic and various other natural and not so natural forces, have so, um, uh, would end up being published, however, to the benefit, thank God, to the benefit of Ramos Otero's work in an extensively annotated, updated, revised edition, confirming thus the author's, Manuel's uh, declaration and the end of his experimental novel, Contra la Muerte, La Suerte. I thus, I am thus uh, profoundly moved when I uh, sit to consider um, uh, that in order to make, uh, to, to make it here tonight, Manuel's text, which was for so long, uh, as Angel said, for so long passed down from hand to hand and in, in yellowed and faded copies, had to cross multiple and unexpected geographies, most particularly that deep, and uh, unfathomable and surveyed, surveyed uh, Bermuda Triangle that is formed by San Juan, Havana, and New York. And it also had to survive two pandemics. But if Manuel's work has taught us anything, it has shown us that the diaspora is not only good at migrating and at leaving, it is also good at returning with a vengeance sometimes and at creating alternative roots of complicity and solidarity. And yes, I dare suggest also cariño and affection, love that allow us to sortear, no? to navigate, to return to Manuel's affirmation, outwit and circumvent those pretended, not so pretended, waters of oblivion and stagnation and even death. There is an image of Manuel, uh, which is often the most, the best known one. Uh, it's the Manuel of solitary landscapes. The one who resists in his very flesh the socially arbitrary and incomprehensible punishment of isolation and solitude. This is the Manuel that is captured by the Puerto Rican painter Angel Rodriguez Diaz, who portrays himself as the abject, expelled, mythological Japanese renegade Suchi Gumo that emerges from the then crumbling Hudson River piers and advances toward the city center unperturbed, dressed in a modernista style, 
geisha kimono and brandishing an ominous umbrella against the storm. But along with that image, along with this image, in counterpoint to it, growing and rising out of it, out of that fervent and just resistance that requires us to assume and demand the full rights of our singularity, it, there is another Manuel, the Manuel of reunions and parties, uh, the Manuel of morning rituals that are also celebrations, the one who encourages us to take up like the storytelling Scheherazade of his tales, the body that is his work and dismember it, disperse it, and rework it into other potential archipelagos of bountiful, beautiful, and fierce collective dialogue. This is the Manuel that we will be channeling tonight. <laughs> the Manuel that I invoke in my edition were in the prologue and in the annotations and in the way that I alter the order of the stories from the original. It is the one that I have, and it is the one that I have asked our distinguished writers here tonight to reinterpret to remake as their own, to bring to life, even to welcome him. And to do this, <laughs> we have gathered an extraordinary group of writers who will read excerpts that they have chosen from Manuel's work, from the Cuentos Completos, with some additional Cuentos in English, in English translation. So we will begin, let me introduce them to you. I'm sure some of you know them, but let me introduce them to you. Maybe you can guess who these people that I'm describing are. <laughs> the author of the works of fiction, Uñas Pintadas de Azul and Abolición del Pato, and of the award-winning studies Queer Ricans and Translocas, the politics of Puerto Rican drag and trans performance. Larry La Fontaine Stokes. <laughs> next to him, after him, the next person to read will be this legendary creator of the Glam Slam, an author of Pierre Queen, Americano, if Jesus were gay, Nefarious, <laughs> Radiance, and most recently, Lovely Child. I'm talking about Emmanuel, Emmanuel Xavier. Xavier. Emmanuel Xavier. <laughs> the journalist photographer, musician, chronicler, and novelist, author of the nonfiction book on Haiti after the earthquake, Puertos Principes, Principes, Temblemos Todos, a beautiful title, and the debut novel on Puerto, Ric on Puerto Rican televangelism and conversion therapy, Demonios, Huascar Robles. <laughs> The translator and memoirist, known for extraordinary translations of the Spanish poet Dionisio Cañas, and for the illuminating and beautifully written personal essays of Manuel Ramos Otero's life here in New York, Consuelo Arias. The cultural activist, writer, and attorney, author of the debut novel on a Massachusetts Rican or Masso Rican queer childhood, Homo 
novas. Gerard Cabrera. And last but not least, <laughs> the, po the revolutionary poet philosopher who writes in Spanish, English, Spanglish, possibly other, other languages, author of El Imperio de los Sueños, translated by Tess O'Dwyer as Empire of Dreams, Jojo Boyne, and the extensively translated and award-winning United States of Banana, and the forthcoming Putinoika, Janina Braski. So, I'll leave you in good hands, okay? And enjoy the trip. Hola, buenas noches. Um, I am Larry Lafontaine. Muchas gracias, Arnaldo, por la invitación. Um, Ramos Otero passed away in 1990, and I arrived in New York in 1991. Hollywood Memorabilia is the first story of Cuentos Completos de Manuel Ramos Otero. It is from his first book, Concierto de Metal, published in 1971 in Puerto Rico. I am God. Yo soy Dios. Y crearé un personaje que se llamará Ángel, se llamará John, se llamará Paul. En las tardes trabajo con las oficinas del gobierno en un programa de investigación social para crear un sistema perfecto de movilidad. No. Las deficiencias del capitalismo no me interesan. ¿Por qué? Porque tengo 23 años. I'm 23 years old. Y pienso que a los 30 moriré con un ataque imprevisto de tuberculosis como Greta Garbo en Camille. De noche trabajo de proyeccionista en un cine de segunda. De segunda porque no se exhiben películas nuevas. Anoche, por ejemplo, presentamos Lady Hamilton y Vivian Lee. Estuvo estupenda. Y salgo muy tarde en la noche. Tan tarde salgo que camino hacia casa y no me queda tiempo para conocer a nadie en el camino, entablar una relación espontánea y rápida e invitarle a que pase a casa a tomar café. También tengo té de jazmín porque conocí a un chico que adora el té de jazmín, pero de todas formas no importa, no importa porque dijo que llegaría a las 8 y después de esperarlo hasta la madrugada supe que no vendría. Aún no he abierto la caja con sobres individuales de té de jazmín. Ah, claro, dije que soy autor. Escribo cuentos cortos y dejo que la vida se me agujere con oraciones que solamente yo comprendo. ¿Por eso soy autor? No, no soy escritor. Escritores, los periodistas del día, los de la noche, los del mundo, los del país. Yo soy un autor con part-time de researcher y proyeccionista. Aunque existe la posibilidad de que ser autor no es profesión alguna y soy tan solo un proyeccionista con un part-time de researcher. Aun cuando no tiene importancia, vivo en la ciudad cuyo nombre no mencionaré. El nombre no, no es necesario. Todas las ciudades son iguales, oscuras, tristes. Parezco introvertido y sin embargo no creo que lo sea. Adoro el cine, sobre todo Hollywood de los 30 y los 40 Ruby Keeler, Busby Berkeley, Humphrey Bogart, Orson Welles, John Ford, Rita Hayward, Greta Garbo, Vivian Lee. A la Garbo y a la Lee las prefiero sobre todas, especialmente a la Garbo de Ninochka y a la Lee de Gone with the Wind y Ernst Lubitsch y Linda Darnell y John Huston. No es necesario conectar mi introversión con la obsesión cinematográfica. Simplemente las ideas corren hasta la cabeza y no puedo evitarlo. Como ahora, por ejemplo, recuerdo que en la superior conocí a Ángel Antonio. Como estaba diciendo, 
In high school, I met Angel Antonio. Y me dio aquel complejo de Scarlett O'Hara y Ashley Wills que aún conservo. Y cada vez que tomo una ducha fría, recuerdo el tema de Tara y lo tatareo. Recuerdo que Ángel era flaco, de ojos oscuros y piel clara y piel castaño con mechones rubios, como Ashley. A veces la realidad se vuelve turbia y desde la cabina de proyección recurro a la creación de imágenes, transposición de las imágenes y lo veo surgir en el lienzo de la pantalla. Quisiera estudiar cinematografía y hacer cine. ¿Talento? No sé. Pero si deseo y devoción son suficientes, no me falta nada para decir, aquí comienzo. Voy a ser cineasta, voy a ser estrella, como Almodóvar, que todavía no estaba haciendo películas cuando se escribió este cuento. Pero si deseo y devoción son suficientes, no me falta nada para decir que aquí comienzo. Mientras tanto, leo a Andrew Saris en el Village Voice. Bien, no lo voy a ocultar, vivo en Nueva York y pensé que al mencionar que leo el Village Voice, lo otro llegaría por conexión del pensamiento sigiloso. Y a veces Manny, a veces Manny Farber y James Agee. No, no importa. Hoy proyecto Citizen Kane y cuando mencionaron Rosebud, por favor, Rosebud, cuando mencionaron Rosebud, la mente se me escapó y llegó a la niñez no tan lejana. La recapturé entre los labios de Agnes Moorhead. Sobre el otro issue, yo soy Dios. I am God. No se sorprenda a nadie de mi divinidad aficionada. No quiero escuchar palmaditas de reconocimiento ni gritos de exasperación. Si prefiere Buda, soy Buda. Si prefiere a David, soy David. Si prefiere a Lenin, soy Lenin. Ahora que sobre todo si prefiere a Marilyn Monroe en Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, la semana entrante la proyecto. Bueno, el personaje se llamará yo. I am the character. Porque después de varias recapitulaciones de la memoria, aún no se me facilita el comienzo. Pero el comienzo perdura en cada segundo que pasa. Ocurre que el comienzo y el final pertenecen al mismo espacio y ya no se distinguen sus formas. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Um, esta noche voy a leer en inglés porque that's what I know best. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Xavier and I'm going to be reading an excerpt called Loca la de la locura, the queen of madness. It's midnight in the midnight club. In a tropical heat of gray nicotine, I am leaning back against a cardboard Corinthian column, lusciously attired in chartreuse taffeta, my skin dazzled by a pink light bulb shining directly down. The frayed scraps of crepe paper waving from a background of palm trees reflect like daggers on the body of this mysterious woman. And I'm singing. The powdered synonym on my face covers the imperfections of the skin like a Muslim's veil. Two round suns of coral-colored rouge accentuate the cheekbones of this accursed Audulisk. The bronze pan stick makes the sudden light from a match bring out a beauty mark. The cream foundation allow the sweat like a soft vague dew in the late night rasp of my voice. The clown white makes me more unreachable than a tortured geisha. My Woolworth's eyelashes begin to loosen at the end. You know. The seven pairs of false eyelashes are the first thing to announce the defeat of beauty. But art triumphs over nature, aided by a languished look of demure suffering, like a mourning virgin who suffers but knows that she gave birth to Christ. He, he is listening to me, and everything was just like that. Even though I was the one singing, it was in his lips singing along with mine that the doubtful words belonged. 
I was like other women, and I was not the same. But he, he dreamt the fucking her, and smelling in it all the putrid odor of the daughter of the great puta of a mother who brought him into this valley of sorrows. They all try to tell me he's a dick. He's a macho hustler. He's from the razor blade school. He'll leave you when you go bald. Men weren't worth it. But one has to try it for herself. One has to suffer like the others to be able to understand suffering. My mother said it well. You aren't going to turn out upright like a strong stalk of wheat, queen of madness, she said. But even the bad wheat needs a man, if only to cut it down with a machete. But now, what the fuck happened to the days when taffeta was everything? <laughs> when he grabbed me by the ass in the finale bar and dry humped me from behind, and he told me, Queen of Madness, ours is one solo destiny. What the hell happened to those long suffering, to those wounded times? I don't regret anything. My mother used to say, life will be difficult. That night, I put on my black crepe dress, flowing to the ground with its discreet little train, the entire edge of the decolletage done in black ostrich feathers, the red as sunset wig, the stormy lightning flash of my rhinestones, the black opera gloves covering with a regalician texture, the intolerable hair of my forearms. He grabbed me against the bar after the show, and he said, Mama, why you do this to me? And a tear almost fell from him. Men invent us with such weepiness and such horniness that a careless confusion between a Cuba Libre and a Chichaito can turn a church singer in a small cafe into a cheap drunk. And a seductive drag queen ends up settling for a shit job in a maiden form bra factory. They just opened the cell and sounded the breakfast whistle. The memory comes back once again, as ugly as the place of gooey rice and the devil brand beans, and as always, the heavy end, the ass of a baguette, a lump my mother would not have even dared to fatten her pigs with. How do you get rid of the flabby love handles brought on by all that bread? That and the custard -y ass shaking of the ass that would be the pride of any Cuban dancer. But that didn't happen to me. All that bread has only given me a big, flat ass. No shape to it at all, like the smashed fender of an old, rusty bus. I remember all of it. The bread of 69, the bread of 72, the year when no one got out of here, and at the end, the ass of the bread of 78. I owe you the blood sausage, baby, my queen of madness. I'll give it to you in the shower so you can eat it wet. We hardly ever get meat in here, never. But I sit in the solitude of my cell, and I remember how one remembers his big dick, as big as Muhammad, makes this forgotten hole yet bleed. Gracias. Um, hi, my name is Oscar Robles, and I have the pleasure to bring the temperature of the room down with a little, uh, <laughs> something that is just not as, as, as uh, fun. But I heard that is uh, from Arnaldo today that this was uh, one of his favorite uh, stories, and I didn't know that. My name is Oscar Robles, and I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to bring a little bit of the temperature of the room down, because it's not as alegre as the previous ones. Um, y me enteré hoy por Arnaldo que es una historia que le encantaba mucho y es un placer para mí poder eh, pues, interpretarla para ustedes eh, del cuento eh, de la mujer del mar uno es tanta gente a la misma vez yo solo puedo contar el cuento de la mujer del mar, el cuento nunca antes contado, de la poeta mateaeña Palmira Párez. Y Ángelo solo puede contar The Story of the Woman of the Sea. 
Tanto escuchó la historia de Vincenta Vitale, de boca de su padre, o se la oyó contar a los ferrocarrileros sicilianos de la New Jersey Central Railroad en los terrenos baldíos de una estación de Bayón. La viajera había iniciado el viaje en un puerto de Nápoli, detrás de un paisaje del Vesubio. Venía de los parrales del Yocabaran, llena de polvo, inmóvil en la popa de un velero. Inmóvil, on the orange aft of a vaporous vessel. Contaba el amado inmóvil, atardeciendo. Había atracado en Casablanca y en las Islas Azores había serpado camino al mar de las Antillas con nosotros campesinos del agua salada. El agosto caluroso del 1913 llegó a San Juan. El orden de sus vidas ha ido diluyéndose en las palabras memoriosas de los cuentos. Era la permanencia fugaz de la llovizna del tiempo. No hay que imponerse los laberintos ineludibles de la trama. Nunca nadie sabrá realmente la historia de la mujer del mar. Estamos coincidiendo débilmente en el triángulo muerto del cuento interminable. En el mar de chiringas de sargazos. Todos sabemos que estos son algas feoficias de falsos tallos y falsas hojas que flotan en los mares cálidos y cubren una gran superficie del Atlántico que en Puerto Rico... Después de todo, es un volcán de sargazos de piedra, la ruina verde de un pueblo en el olvido, que en medio del mar de los sargazos está, inevitablemente, el islote, la isla Tempo Andante, de San Juan Bautista frente al mar. El sol del atardecer como un hotel, muriendo como un tigre negro en el atardecer, que siempre hay un velero o un barco de vapor, cruzando la bahía anaranjada hacia Nueva York. Tal vez no sea lo mejor contar la historia de Palmira Pérez ni perseguir las historias de Vincenza Vitale. Quizás no sea lo mejor amar como el cuentero amó al enano napolitano. Estos calores infieren la helada, lo mismo que una danza de morelas testigua la mortalidad del mar. Pero solo tal vez hay una correspondencia fatal entre el cuento y la vida, entre el pasado y el destino, entre los poetas y los hombres, entre el amor y la muerte. Pero solo tal vez, nada es más ambiguo que la palabra, ni siquiera los espejos. Y sin embargo, solo las palabras son los espejos del tiempo. Por eso contaré el cuento, si lo quiere la mujer hindú que me protege, porque será la causa de la emancipación de la noche del amor. Uno será siempre del otro, sobre todo en la noche, aunque no quiera. De las mil, es de noche que fuimos hilvanando el cuento de la mujer del mar interminablemente, ignorando que el cansancio es la regla de todas las relaciones. Y una noche terminó, después de haber contado con los dedos de las nocturnas palabras de los besos del silencio, como terminan los cuentos detrás de la última página. Ya sé que al fin y al cabo, pedidos en el espejo del agua del mar, buscaremos a la mujer. Un solo tul de noches árabes ocultándole a la cara de la luna un incienso de violetas africanas o el gesto, haciendo de noche como las bromelias o como el verano o como la felicidad. Ángelo y yo nos amaremos para siempre. Aunque las enfermedades incurables como el cáncer o el sífilis, nos separen. Quedan las miles de noches del amor en busca de la muerte, volando sobre dunas amarillas con ángeles de polvo, haciendo las calles abandonadas de los muelles, ardiendo en ruinas, cogidos de la mano de la luna para no ver el sol, prendiendo y apagando la luz de bengala, contándonos el cuento de la vida en la negra intemperie de la madrugada, candelabros de hierba quebrándonos los labios, alucinando sobre peldaños orinados en las iglesias de Christopher Street. Rechazando la regada ineludible del miedo, todo terminará con el orden en la sombra de las palabras, como el presentimiento incierto de que esta noche todo terminará otra vez. Como un ataque al corazón negro del amor. Uno siempre será del otro, aunque no quiera. Muchas gracias.
La Fea Otero. Oops. You hear me? Okay. Okay. La Fea Otero. Fragments. Mi madre me dijo una vez, nunca serás famoso hasta que yo me muera. Entonces escribirías sobre mí y te llegará la fama. Ella tiene la culpa de que no haya escrito ese libro. Todas las profecías son desvíos fatales en el camino que solamente conduce al cementerio o al crematorio. De tanto esperar su muerte, se me olvidó vivir mi vida. Ahora me doy cuenta de que solo quería ser recordada. Huella sobre la tierra. Ella que solo supo estar parada como un sol de mediodía, perpendicular, sin sombra, petrificada dentro de sus tacos de charol. Amarnos y odiamos. No pudo haber sido nuestra condena, sino el que cada uno de nosotros deseara tanto al otro hasta que cada cual se olvidara de su propio destino. Desde siempre repudiamos los relojes. Ahora solo importa cuál morirá primero. Un odio inmenso obliga a mi escritura. Nadie tiene derecho a morirse y a pensar que ya te enseñe todo lo que tenía que enseñarte sobre la vida. Los vivos estamos demasiado acostumbrados a vivir, a vivir de dos en dos, falsificando un amor que nunca se realiza. Yo no le debo nada a mi, ma a mi madre, solamente le, deseo, le debo mi soledad. Y el tiempo solo existe para la soledad. Yo siempre estuve enamorado de mi madre. Siempre fue mucho más fácil enamorarme de ella que amarla. Lo difícil fue seguir sus pasos por los callejones de su miedo. Si es que alguna vez sintió lo que la gente llama miedo. Esa llaga repentina, insobornable, que nos hace perder la única persona que creemos ser. Mi madre siempre estuvo enamorado de mí, enamorada de mí. Tal vez porque ella fue completamente responsable de mi nacimiento. Una vez me dijo, nunca quise parir hijos. Cuando me di cuenta de que estaba preñada, ya era muy tarde para otro aborto. Beth Israel Hospital, Dementia, Consuelo, te amo, vives, te odio, muero, te desgarro, te violento. Te odio. Te amo. ¿Cómo es posible imaginar esperanzas azules? Es la primera metáfora que recuerdo cantada irresponsablemente por mi madre. Con la escoba en la mano, cantada irresponsablemente por mi madre. Mientras exprimía el pan para el pudín de pasas cantada irresponsablemente por mi madre, cuando se perfumaba con extracto de narcisos negros. Ella siempre me vestía de blanco, trajes de hilo blanco bordados a mano, zapatos de hebilla blancos lustrados como palomas, uñas blancas limadas por los ángeles de la Virgen de la Candelaria. Un contrato de purificación que nos hacía cómplices, cómplices a cadena perpetua de unas esperanzas azules invisibles que a ella la llevaron a parir al que ahora cuenta su historia, que al que la cuenta llevaron a comprender la única verdad irremediable. Escribir no es otra cosa 
que perseguir el vuelo de las esperanzas azules y solamente por ellas lograré descifrar el enigma de mi madre. Tal vez, porque, tal vez porque no me pasara lo mismo que le había pasado a ella. Terminó por hacerme su sueño. Un niño perfecto, intachable, inmaculadamente limpio, con modales impecables de sobremesa. Un ángel de carne y hueso que salvara del olvido. Y ella sí creía en los muertos. Uno de sus favoritos tocaba danzas puertorriqueñas en el piano de la sala. Otro se le aparecía vestido de hilo blanco, de pies a cabeza, y mi madre lo había identificado con su padre. August, New York, crossing 7th Avenue South, calor implacable. Consuelo, si fuera por mí, siempre me vestiría de blanco, como un caballero de provincias. A change of tone. The exemplary life of the slave and the master. Do it the way I tell you, or don't do it at all. Spit in my face. Dripping, dripping the saliva, dripping, dripping all the way from your lowered eyes to the end of your rough chin, spittle hangs like jungle vines. Spit while your hand is clenched. Spit the way I tell you, or don't spit on me at all. On his eyes so he can't see. He rubs the slimy saliva with his sticky hands. From his throat, the spit that crashes down on my face. His fingers displacing space on my face. Do it harder or don't do it at all. Rigid hands like hard pumice redden the deserted surface of the face. The gummy spit on the black hairs of the mustache that covers the mouth and the saliva in his mouth mix together. He contracts his lips. I spit on the photographs glued to your eyes. I break your face from side to side on the pillow. Do it the way I tell you to do it. Harder, more, the back, the ass, the face, squashed by the hands, trampled by the master's stinking feet, and I, your slave. If the blinds had been open on that hot noon of the city, the smells of carburetors and chimneys would have reached us. There would have been sunlight streaked by the rose-colored blinds, and this would not have had any importance. When he walks, with his jeans worn at the knees on the hips that form two moons on his cheeks and a scorpion on the curve of his dick, but when he walks, the left thigh, which is where the dick rests, takes a step forward and moves like a pendulum, rubbing the jeans between the flesh, not so tanned by the sun, of course, but covered by fuzz and the worn out denim of the jeans. When he walks, his balls, with their delirium over the bridge of the thighs, move indecisively from side to side, but prefer to spill over the right thigh. And I, his slave, I've said, piss on my life, or don't piss on me. Piss on my veins, like channels of all the islands constructed on water. Piss on my islands of flesh made purple by the suctioned blow of the mouth. The master pisses on the white stone that I am. Golden torrents 
run, whirling down on the ends of the slave's body. Piss on me the way that I tell you, or don't piss on me at all. Hot. Son of water. Hot son of water am I, liquid sunflowers. Burning petals of wet light, the master urinates. His sleeping hose unwinds. He shoots jets of solitude. I used to fuck with Chopin, or I wouldn't fuck at all. From the bed, only the record player can be seen. But the record, the military Polonaise, Opus 40, number one, can't be seen. And since the closed blinds don't allow the other to be seen, the edge of the island, the docks, the jail, the indigo blue policeman fucking in the back alleys, and the number one macho with his 40 inches of torture. He smells like a sweaty dick at night. He smells like an asshole, observed but not touched. He leans against the perpendicularly perfect edge of a building. But when he leans, it must be because the left leg angles and the foot. I didn't mention it before, sin of omission, but he's wearing white tennis sneakers, worn down from so much walking around here, hoping that his slave walks by, that he looks at the dirty and torn canvas sneakers that he is enthralled with and the stench of his feet. He smells of death, the street where he is. Christopher Street, or the alley of the chapel where the master mortifies himself. His thing is dead, but if it wasn't, put your whole fist inside of me or don't put it in at all. Finger by finger, first put in your big finger. He feels the carnivorous walls, wild orchids hanging on the walls. Put your whole fist inside me, that's what I said, but he didn't hear me, because he put in the thumb knife edge, threat of murder, illuminated by the moon. Put your whole fist inside me. The index finger slid in like a candle, and it bent the way rainbows do. Thank you. Temporal, temporal, que allá viene el temporal. ¿Qué será de mi borinquen si nos coge el temporal? Temporal, temporal, que allá viene el temporal. Viento de viento, de viento de agua, de viento de agua, de agua con viento. De viento lejano, de viento cercano, de aguas lejanas de aguas cercanas, que el viento se lleva con su paso de viento, su paso de agua, de agua con viento, de viento con agua, de agua con agua, de viento con viento y sonido de palmas, y palmas que caen mojadas con agua de viento, que el viento destruye, que el viento se lleva, que el viento levanta en el viento de grises azules, de viento de agua, de grises océanos perdidos, con viento que azota, con viento que vuelve, con viento que barre los techos de hojas, los techos de zinc, las casas sin techo, las casas mojadas con agua de viento, con viento de agua, las casas mojadas, derrumbe de casas mojadas, de viento que barre y derrumba y destroza las casas, los suelos, las vigas, la tierra, la tierra sin tierra, la tierra inundada, la tierra mojada con agua de viento, con nombres de santos, de espíritus muertos, de espíritus vivos, en viento de agua que destruye, que barre y destroza, 
que cruza la isla, se inunda la isla, se vuelve la isla una tumba de lluvia, una tumba de viento furioso que rompe las calles y rompe los bosques, el ojo de viento y de agua en el mar que va revolviendo a su paso los mares de agua, los cielos de viento de lluvias que azotan las playas, revuelven la arena y apagan el sol, y la luna y enlutan estrellas con grises azules de viento, de muerte, de viento, de muerte que vuela, de muerte que azota, de muerte que ahoga, de muerte que cubre la tierra con presagios de campos destrozados. La caña no crece, las flores se mueren, la gente se muere, las casas se caen de miedo a la lluvia de ciclones rotos, en el viento, ciclones calientes, ciclones que corren en las ramas y matan la vida y traen la muerte con viento de viento de viento y azote de agua y azote de viento. Y olas se vuelcan en la costa y arrasan los pueblos y cortan la vida y cruzan la isla. Y el ciclón no pasa y el ciclón se queda San Ciprián y muerte San Felipe. Y hambre San Siriaco llega y destruye y destruye y destruye con viento y con agua y con viento de viento sobre los cafetales y los campos de viandas podridos de agua y heridos de viento y los pobres más pobres y el rico más rico para explotar al pobre que sufre, que muere y que sufre, que vive y que sufre, que vive y que muere que vive y que teme ciclones, huracanes, tormentas, temporales, huracán, que destruye y castiga y que mata, huracán. Temporal, temporal, allá viene el temporal, 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 allá viene el temporal. ¿Qué será de mi borinquen si nos coge el temporal? ¿Qué será? de mi borinquen si nos coge el temporal. Merci. This is your chance to ask a question, uh, in the Creta or no? Uh, this is the chance. But you know, this I'm speechless. This is amazing, man, unbelievable. So you see that you see that uh, you see the range yeah. of Manuel Ramos. You have just experienced not only the range of these writers, but the range of Manuel Ramos Otero. Yeah. Okay, so it's here. <laughs> um, any comments or questions that you'd like to ask? This is your chance. Okay, yes. Is there an English? Is there an English translation in the works? There is. There's actually an English translation in the works. It will be edited by um, Columbia University, and it is um, edited by Francis Negron Montaner. Yes, so there is. It'll be an anthology. This is the complete um, short stories, but that will include um, a, a fragment, a section of uh, a novel, of an experimental novel, and poetry. He's also well known as a poet. Mm -hmm. Any, any other? So, who are the translators or translators? A whole team, a whole team uh, from Columbia University. Um, yes. So the ones that were. The ones that were in English. Yeah, what they were in English? He wrote in English, or were they no? Translated? Those were translations, uh, and uh, 
will give you the, the those first translations that were published uh, in a long time ago in the 80s uh, and um, what Gregory, used to be called uh, Gregory exactly exactly so um, some of those translations are also a disease um, so but yes these will be uh, the other ones will be new translations and anything else comments uh, Gracias, nena. Epa. Bueno, um, all of this brought him here, but especially temporal, temporal. But Janina, Dios mío. Okay. Um, anything else? Well, Arnaldo, can I can I ask a yes. question to the other panelists? Yes, please. I so I. I, when I read this out loud the first couple of times at home and I was practicing, I felt a completely different experience when I was reading it, you know, for leisure. And, and, and now, you know, performing it and, and with the intent of trying to get, you know, this character out, they had a completely different emancipating experience in me. And I was wondering how everybody felt here when they, when they were reading this out loud. Yes. How was your experience interpreting this? <laughs> we'll have secret microphones in our behinds. Me lo saqué del culo. Exactamente. And that's my answer. <laughs> it was stuck in my butt and I just I just pulled it out. She also had it stuck in her butt. I don't even have a butt. It's live. It's live. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I experienced him. Him. Because I experienced the text. I experienced the text the way I experienced Manuel in life. And when I read him, especially aloud, which I never do, and also in Spanish, I never read aloud in Spanish, I, in, I experience it, his incantatory poetic quality, but above all, the incantatory, bewitching quality. I was going to say, I, I, I came into the scene like around 1997, so I wasn't familiar with his work. But when you sent me, you know, these uh, the opportunity to read some of this, um, I found a poetry in it. I wanted to. I mean, he has such a great voice, and that's just the translation of it into English. And so he was very poetic, and it was all just there for me to to work with. Janina or Gerard. I was quite intimidated by the piece, <laughs> but I loved reading it. Yes, and you did an amazing, yeah, um, did. amazing job. I because. felt my voice starting to tremble uh, yes. Uh, yes. from the text. That's yes. a good thing. Yes. That, Janina? I met, I met Manuel and I went with him to Chicago and we read poetry together and we slept in the same room at night. And this was like six months before he got sick. And when he got sick, he gave me a call and he said, come and visit me, don't bring me flowers, bring me rum. So I went and I went with a bottle of rum, with Arnaldo Cruz, by the way. We were, we were scared because at that time nobody had AIDS, you know? It was like the, the first cases. And, and I was scared also because my brother died two, a year later, so I was, I was, I was really scared uh, because of the whole thing. So we went to the hospital and we brought him the run and he put it in a glass and uh, smoking, he was smoking. <laughs> And it was beautiful because at that time there was not uh, this this new wave of, of health that we have today that people want to live healthy. At that time it was intense. People wanted to live intensely 
even if it's of short duration, you want to live in ten the intensity of life. So, that's how it was. That's how it was, and that's how he lived. And he was a beautiful person. I, I'm here be because of him. I really love him. Thank you. Personal, um, yeah, I thought it was that like narcissistic. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't about no, that. It's these were, moments. these were moments, and and I think you chose the perfect text for me yeah, because you. that moment with the white linen, I mean, that was a real conversation, yes. and that's why I chose the fragments. Sobre el hilo blanco. Yes, yes. And of course, the other fragment, you know, mm -hmm. the complicated relationship mm -hmm. we had. Yes. They were very close, and he thought of you very. He, he, uh, it was. Like uh, Manuel and Consuelo were very close, and they, um, I, he identified. In, in his dementia. His mother. In his dementia. Yeah. Yes. And also the way we looked. He died in 1990. He died of AIDS, yes. He died of AIDS, yes. But yeah. people were hallucinating, I mean, yeah. the kinds of drugs that you were taking. But and all, yes, were. he was fabulous hallucinating because it was like vivir del cuento y morir del cuento. ¿Sabes? Porque uno no sabía, bueno, eso igual es verdad, porque nunca se sabía. Yo me llegué a cre creer ciertos disparates, porque él como era tan disparatero, why not? Sí, Pásale el micrófono. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was a surreal, just beautiful experience. I was asking myself as I heard you guys, uh, what happens when a writer reads a writer aloud? Mm. This is the privilege we have tonight. And uh, it dawned on me when Consuelo was uh, reading her part, and uh, it became uh, super evident when Janina uh, uh, finished writing hers. Uh, curiously, the only two women in the in the group, from what I can gather. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just uh, I just felt that uh, writers reading writers are not just readers. So. I guess what was just transformative for me was the closest thing one could get to having Manuel tonight oh, yeah. is having writers such as you uh, giving us the pleasure and the honor of listening to him in a somewhat transmuted uh, 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 way. Uh, listening to him, listening to him. And, and, and what's really lovely uh, is that you read both in English and, and, and Spanish, and it was just so much in your own voice and your own cadence and, and your own style. And isn't, isn't this what writing is about? I don't want to sound too communistic about it, but why not? You know? uh, uh, we have this incredible idea of what an author is, yeah. and it's usually so incredibly narcissistic and individualistic, but one way of, of, of seeing you know, the tragedy of Manuel's death, you know, which is so much the tragedy, the tragedy of our generation, you know, uh, in this beautiful way, of, 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 of um, allowing for that uh, amazing uh, voice to be transmuted and uh, multiplied, multiplied. And, and I'm, 
you know, I'm not talking about criticism or anything like that. I'm talking about writing. And, uh, and what you taught us tonight is that uh, reading can be writing. Mm -hmm. And particularly reading uh, aloud. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Because it's the closest we can get what, what we just witnessed tonight to having Manuel here with us. Yeah. I'm sounding Hi, thank you, thank you all so much for a an incredible reading. I am an educator. I teach at the college level, and I'm curious to know. So I'm re relatively new to uh, Manuel's work, and I'm curious to know whether you have thoughts or desires, particularly as uh, both the readers and as I'm gathering a lot of people in the crowd too, who have met, lived among or with uh, Manuel, what, in what ways do you think that he as a magnetic figure and, and center of a community it seems, that we can teach him? Kind of an abstract question, but just I'm curious if you have if you have any ideas for somebody who who reads him very much able to appreciate the the spiritual weight of it, but also as somebody who's somewhat of an outsider and and wants to take advantage of of being in a context that clearly carries this his spirit. How you can teach him, I'm sorry. How you can teach him, read him. Read him aloud. That's what I think. Aloud. This, the students reading it aloud. That's the best way of, of teaching Manuel, in my opinion. Yeah, that I agree. There's a technical side that we witness, you know, the range of, you know, how he can transform uh, the stories, but in the way that he transformed them, we, we heard how he basically just sort of like re traumatized a lot of us with the uh, with the hurricane story in a way that it was so beautiful um, uh, we have the the poetry uh, defending of death through the mujer del mar i mean like there's a, there's a, the wealth of stories and the, the depth of these stories and this book contains his earlier work when he was like a kid and he started to tar start to publish all the way to when his work was really advanced and going to different directions um, i think also one of the things that about his personality or maybe like in the vein of what you were saying, his spirit, I think uh, there's a lot of also his essays that were also published by Folium in a book called uh, No Tener Miedo a Las Palabras, like Not to Be Afraid of Words. I think it's important. Um, I think that he didn't really uh, believe in censorship. I don't think he would be, he would be canceled like 10 years ago if he lived it right now. Um, and he just simply was a, a person who was genuine. And I think that carried through his art. Uh, so I think that's, uh, his essays also would, would be a guide, I think. And his his fiction uh, is very metatextual, but you know it's it's uh, not necessarily because he's trying to be hyper theoretical, but because it's about storytelling. So you can introduce some of some of these stories as through the storytellings that they have, so through the stories that they have heard and that they themselves every single day, um, you know, uh, uh, recreate for their own friends. Every time they tell a story, Manuel's stories are really always very conscious of telling a story. Mm -hmm. And that is what children need. That this is not something foreign. This is what everyone does and you're constantly doing, making them aware and conscious that they're constantly doing that, they're making stories, and that they can make stories. I also want to say I appreciate that as a teacher you want to share this work, and I appreciate Arnaldo for putting this book together and for keeping our history and our culture alive, because that is really important for our community. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. This is just.
that creative <laughs> way of, as Ruben said, of bringing Manuel back to the yeah. place where he wrote in the book. Um, microphone. Yes. Mi microphone. The microphone. Uh, oh, the microphone. Yes, yeah, so thank you for uh, bringing Manuel back. Thank you for participating in this creative way of bringing him back. And please do, do buy the book. You'll enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>